Today's video does contain sensitive subject matter, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. And if you have a story you'd like to send my way, just go to asthereavendreams.com and click the big button on the screen to do so. And of course, thank you. I was a pretty dumb teenager, or preteen growing up. I always tried to push the boundaries of what I was allowed to do or what I could get away with. I had a couple of younger siblings too, and one older than me, so I guess you could call it the middle child syndrome. I wanted the freedom my older brother had, as he had his own car and was able to go wherever he wanted, with little question from my parents. I also ended up watching my little sister and brother at times when I wanted to hang out with my friends. So, when my parents told me that I was too old to trick or treat, but said that I could stay home and hand out candy, I became a little upset. I was okay with not going with them to trick or treat, but I certainly did not want to stay cooped up at home during the holiday. So, I voiced my concerns. Thankfully, they finally saw my side of things and agreed to let me stay with a friend for the night. I quickly packed a small bag of things, called my friend to have their parents pick me up, and I was free for the night. The thing is, we made plans, so I was hopeful that my parents would agree to let me go. My friend, Charlie, his brother Mikey, who was two years older than us, and I were all going to meet up with a few other friends at an old cemetery. We were just going to walk around, tell stories, and maybe try our hand at ghost hunting. All in all, it was the three of us plus Mikey's friend that they called Trout, plus our other three friends Becca, Lance, and Mira. We lived in a pretty small town with very little crime, and everyone kept to themselves. Not only was crime uncommon, but anything really worth talking about, which meant there was little life going on after dark. This was how we got away with going to the cemetery. It was a pretty old one, and I couldn't recall ever seeing a service ever being held there. So I think it was just kept as it was, and that was that. It was also within walking distance, so we all met there. There weren't any trespassing signs when we got there, just a small gate to keep cars from going in it. We could practically just step over it. The girls became nervous right from the start, but we did our best to keep them calm so we didn't have to leave before we even did anything. So, we got in and started walking around, looking at the different headstones and trying to find the oldest one. After looking at them all, and some of the harmless but eerie sayings on them, we made our way over behind the small building that was there. There was a small clearing behind it with a couple of milk crates, a bucket with water and cigarette butts in it, and some other random stuff, and then the back of the cemetery was lined with trees. We stopped there for a bit and just talked, teasing each other. Mikey and Trout told us some creepy story about a kid who unalived himself in the gym locker rooms at the old high school several years ago, and that he was now haunting it, claiming that that's why they built the new school. The old high school is now for the board or something, so it's not really used a lot. The girls were definitely freaking out, and Charlie kept affirming everything he was saying, but... I think the rest of us were a little skeptical. They mentioned that they wanted to try to break in there to see, but argued with Charlie and I about going, saying that if he got caught, he didn't want us to get into trouble too. After some time, we got more on the topic of ghosts, and again, Mikey and Trout tried to spook us saying there was definitely paranormal stuff going on here. While we joked around, the girls were getting more scared and started saying that we should leave. The rest of us weren't really ready to head back though, so they said they would just walk back alone. Becca lived the closest, and she was pretty much down the street from the cemetery, and Mira was staying the night with her too. While it was a mood kill, 
I would like to think that I was still some kind of gentleman, so I agreed to walk them out, just to make sure they got out okay, and that way I could see them most the way down the sidewalk. Lance said that he would go with us too, so the other three stayed where they were until we got back. The cemetery went pretty far back, and the entrance was to the side a bit more, so we would lose sight of the others from the front for sure. Not to mention the fact that there were no lights in there. The only light that we had was from the flashlights that we brought, and from those that had cell phones. I was not one of those people, but the girls shared a flashlight, and I had mine as well. We didn't talk much on our way to the front, but then Becca turned around and asked me what I had said. When I said that we didn't say anything, she looked confused or suspicious, but continued on. That's when I presume I heard what she did. It sounded like someone whispering very quickly, so I, I couldn't make out what was being said. I brought it up, and they all agreed that they heard it too. We tried to ignore it, but the girls only seemed to be more worried. That's when from the corner of my eye to the right, opposite of the building, I saw a dark figure run across the grounds. I assume that Becca saw it too because she screamed. Lance and I tried to calm them and tell them just to hurry up, so they started running. The next thing I know was we started picking up the pace to keep up with them when I felt someone push me from behind. I fell to the ground and everything went immediately pitch black. It made no sense to not be able to see anything. I could at least make out dark shapes of the plots, my friends, or hell, wherever my flashlight landed, but there was nothing. Then, the gurgling sounds started. It was like someone was right by my ear choking on water or something, and lastly was the pressure. I couldn't breathe. It felt as if someone was covering my face. I remember swinging my arms in front of me trying to grab or push off whatever was on me, but nothing was working. Then, out of nowhere, I could hear Lance yelling my name and I was being pulled to a streetlight. I looked around confused, not understanding what just happened, but ironically, all three of them were as pale as a ghost. I asked them what happened when they explained that they had just heard the thump of me falling to the ground. Lance ran over to me and watched horrified as my eyes were wide open, seemingly trying to look around while my arms flailed in front of me like I was fighting something. He said there was nothing there, though. He finally found an opening to grab my arm and pretty much dragged me out of there until I stood on my own feet. I sat on the curb while he called Charlie, telling him that we needed to leave. And they finally walked back to the front, all looking a bit concerned. Lance explained what he saw, and then I explained my side of it. Mikey didn't seem to take it serious at first, saying that we were just messing with him, but Charlie seemed convinced of what happened. I certainly wasn't ready to go back in there after whatever the hell that was, so we finally convinced Mikey and Trout to go. We walked the girls back to Becca's place, and I did my best to act like I was fine, so as to not worry them. But honestly, that scared the hell out of me. I don't want to say that I thought I was going to die, but the fact that I seemed to go completely blind and couldn't breathe, it was pretty damn terrifying. The rest of us walked to a nearby gas station to be in the light, and we talked about what happened a bit more. Charlie, Mikey, and Trout claimed that they were behind the building the whole time, and even thought that we were trying to pull some kind of prank because they could hear the whispering and gurgling too. I don't think they were trying to mess with us either, since Lance ran for me and clearly didn't see anyone around. We ended up going back to Charlie's house for a while to chill before Trout and Lance went home too. I didn't really sleep that night. I was still pretty shaken up and wondering what that could have been or meant. I am past it now that I'm an adult, but I still tell people about it because it was one of the most terrifying things to happen to me. 
If anyone out there knows what that could have been or meant, though, I'm all for hearing your thoughts. Oh, and no, I did not and will not be going back to that cemetery. I have a short but honestly terrifying story that happened to me about 15 years ago on Halloween night. For some background, I live in a fairly decent little town outside of a major city. It's more of a growing suburb than anything, and it's mostly pretty quiet. At the time of this story, I was 28 and my son was just turning 8, so he was at that age where he still needed my help with a lot of things in life, but he was also wanting to be more independent. So, I was doing my best not to smother him. But I was also still doing what I could to make sure he was going down the right path and didn't need help. I raised him by myself, without his father, so it was tough, but it's just part of being a parent. On this particular Halloween, he wanted to go trick-or-treating, and I, of course, was going to go with him. But he also didn't want me hovering over him. He was, in his words, big enough to go to the door alone and knock. It was also rather cold and wet that year, so he and I made a compromise. I would drive the car to each road and direct him which houses to go to, and I would watch him from the car and he would get to do it all by himself unless he physically needed help. I would drive him to each street, and we would do this until it got too late or he started getting tired. For most of the night, things went smoothly. He was pretty happy to be walking between the houses on his own. I was happy that I was able to watch him and not upset him. He would go to the houses, do his trick-or-treating, and they would ask where his parents were, and he would tell him that his mom was watching from the car because he didn't need help. Most of the older people would just laugh at these comments, and some of the younger ones I think had an issue with it, but... We were both happy, so whatever. Every time he would get into the car, he would show me his bag and what they gave him, and he would tell me that he was having a lot of fun, so it was a great night. However, on one street, things went from really fun to actually quite horrifying. We had pulled up on the street, and everything looked normal. A few of the houses were dark, and there weren't many trick-or-treaters, but I figured that was more because of the time than anything. It was getting late. There were a few houses with their lights on, so I told him to go to the three houses and come back to the car, and then said we would make a game plan from there. He said okay, hopped out of the car, and started to the first house. As soon as I saw him finish up at the first house and then make his way to the second, I felt something cold hit the side of my head. I started to look over toward whatever it was, but it clicked pretty fast. There was a guy dressed in all black holding a gun to the side of my head, and he very forcefully told me to get out of the car and to not make a scene. I was obviously panicking. My son was at one of these houses, and he was going to come back to the car at any point, so I wasn't going to do anything to make this guy pull the trigger. I told him okay, and that I would do what he was asking, and I opened the door and stepped out. As soon as my feet hit the pavement, he shoved me off to the side and jumped into the car, and then took off down the road going way too fast. Thankfully, there weren't many people on this road at the time because with how fast he was going, he wouldn't have been able to stop if a child had walked out into the road. I stood up, still freaking out, and I immediately ran over to the house that my son was at. He was still getting candy from them when I walked up, and the old man at the door looked up and smiled asking if I was his mother. I said that I was and I think that he realized something was wrong right away based on my tone. I started to tell him what had just happened, 
And as soon as I said it, I just started bawling. He told me to come inside, so the two of us stepped in, and he said that he would call the police. His wife came over and asked what happened, and he told her, and... Honestly, the whole thing was just such a terrifying and embarrassing mess. Here I was with my eight-year-old son in some random old couple's house, crying my eyes out because some rando had just carjacked me. Of course, my brain was sifting through those anxious thoughts about how it could have gone if my son was in the car at the time, how it would have traumatized him, all that. They called the cops, and the old lady got some water for myself and my son, and we sat there while she held a pretty nice conversation with him. She actually gave him the rest of their candy, and they shut off their porch lights, and then she showed him how to crochet or knit, I don't really remember. He was entertained, and thankfully didn't really understand the whole situation beyond something bad had happened. When the cops got there, I gave them all the information that I had on the guy. I didn't really see his face, but I saw the logo on his jacket and shoes, and I gave them all the information on my car. After they left, the old man said that he would take the two of us home. Thankfully, I had a spare key hidden in the front yard so I could at least get back into the house. The whole time, I was apologizing to the man for the inconvenience, and he just told me that he was happy to help and sorry that the whole thing happened. After we got home, my son wanted to stay up and watch scary movies, and as much as I wanted to tell him no because it was late, I just said screw it and let him enjoy the night. I ended up falling asleep on the couch while he was watching some creepy movie, and the next morning when I woke up, he was passed out on the floor with candy wrappers everywhere. I ended up calling him out of school the next day, and I called out of work so that we could just hang out together at the house, since I knew he wasn't going to be up to go to school, and I wasn't really in the right mindset to go to work. And to wrap this up, they did actually find my car after a few days, but they never found the guy. The car was abandoned on the side of the highway after he had blown a tire and one of the wheels was pretty messed up, but thankfully, there wasn't any damage that couldn't be repaired. It was expensive, sure, but thankfully my parents were able and willing to help me. I can't imagine how stressful it would have been if they couldn't have. When he got a bit older, I did finally explain to him what actually happened mostly because I've always tried to be open with him. He said he didn't really remember that night, so at least I know he wasn't traumatized by the whole thing. For me, however, that was the most terrifying Halloween I had ever had, and it's probably the scariest thing to happen to me personally. We did go trick-or-treating for a couple of years after that, but we just stuck to our block. So, to everyone out there, stay diligent, and make sure that you don't let anyone sneak up on you like I did. Halloween is supposed to be a fun night, so make sure you're staying safe out there so that everybody can enjoy the holiday's festivities. Back in high school, I was invited to a friend's Halloween party. It was actually being hosted by this girl, Iris, who had practically grown up with us, so we had always been really close. She had also recently broken up with her boyfriend, Blaine, so I was hoping to be there for support and to make sure that she had a good time, keeping her mind preoccupied. Now, this dude was a real jerk. He was very possessive and controlling, so I was glad that she ditched him. He didn't like her hanging out with several of her friends, including me or other guys. He was the jealous type, or maybe he was just projecting because he did cheat on her. He obviously was not invited to the party, and her parents even said that to not only her, but me. 
while her mom explicitly told me that if he did show up, to call them immediately. So, yes, this wasn't some secret party or anything. Her parents allowed it. As they were going to go out that night, literally leaving the house to us. The party was going to actually be in the garage, though. It was one of those two-car garages, and there was only going to be about a dozen kids max, so there was plenty of room. This way, we also weren't in the way or a bother to them if they came home early. They bought some decorations, snack foods, candy, and drinks for us. Her dad even got an old stereo and TV from some thrift store and set it up in there to have music or watch movies. The day of Halloween and the party was going to be that Saturday, so I went over there after school on Friday to help her decorate and to organize the place. Going to the day of the party now, I dressed up in something simple yet creepy. I had a black suit and tie, and I found a plain white head and face cover with small mesh spots for the eyes and mouth. I was abnormally tall for my age, so I was going as Slenderman. It was pretty good, even if it was a lazy attempt, I suppose. I was just excited for the party and to have fun with my friends. I entered through the side door as the garage door itself was covered in decorations. We also didn't want to have to open the whole thing each time someone came or went. Iris and two other girls were already there and chatting, so I went over and talked with them. I helped her bring out the last few food items, and as more people arrived... Her parents came in to check on us and let us know that they were leaving, so we were all left to ourselves. The last few people showed up, so we turned up the music and just talked, laughed, and ate for about an hour or so. A song came on the radio, so a couple of the girls, Iris included, started doing some dumb dance to it while the rest of us watched. Once it was over... I went to approach Iris, and I noticed that her face turned sour. She seemed to be looking past me, so I turned around to look and saw none other than Blaine grabbing a handful of pretzels. He'd been dressed up as Ghostface, so no one noticed that it was him. Granted, we were kind of dumb, I guess, to not double-check faces, but there was really only a small group of people that were going to be there. And, since he wasn't exactly invited, and everyone that was there knew that, we didn't expect him to show up under a mask to try to get in. I told her that I would tell him to leave, but she declined, saying that she would take care of it. If I had known what I knew about him now, I would not have let her. She approached him, and I heard her saying something about him not being invited. The other guests noticed too, so we were trying to give them privacy, but we also couldn't look away. I got into a small conversation with one of the other guys there, but it wasn't long after that that I heard Blaine's outburst. He shouted something like, You didn't even give me a chance to explain! Iris was shouting back, so I decided to step in, not only for safety, but at the request of her parents. I told him he was not allowed to be there, and that he needed to leave when he backed up and started making comments about Iris and I. He said he was going to call the cops on us for having an illegal party, which made Iris laugh. She said that her parents set this all up, and she encouraged him to call the cops as he would be the one arrested. This seemed to anger him more, so he pulled out what we thought was a fake knife for his costume, but quickly realized that was not the case. He made some loud, threatening comments, causing everyone to stop and watch at this point. I held my hands up and tried to calm him down as I slowly stepped in front of Iris. Unfortunately, he noticed my maneuver, and he immediately shoved me to the side, cutting me in the shoulder, and he went straight for Iris. She tried running back to get to the door, but he grabbed her by the arm and was waving the knife in her face. I don't know what came over me. Maybe it was just the dumb teenage adrenaline, but 
I kicked him in the back of the knee, and he dropped like a bag of bricks. I felt bad since he did have a knife and was in Iris' face, but thankfully, he dropped the knife as he fell, and she just got headbutted by him as he went down. Before I could process my actions, I'd kicked him in the side hoping to knock the wind out of him and to keep him down, and one of the other guys there got on his back to hold him down. I dropped down to sit across his legs to stop him from kicking, and I yelled to have someone call the cops. It was exhausting holding him down, but it probably didn't take as long as we thought it did. The police showed up, and talked to all of us, and he was left in the back of the cop car as we waited for her parents to get there. The cops talked to her parents and made it seem like it was just a bunch of teenage drama. Her parents got pretty mad at them about this, and even escorted them into the house to show them their knives, to show the one that he had wasn't from their place. He did leave with the cops, and their parents decided to stay home for the rest of the night, but they didn't bother us. The rest of the night went fine, we just had to cheer up Iris a bit as she felt her party had been ruined when, really, it gave us something to laugh about. And, to be honest, I felt like we made a good team of guys protecting the girls. We did later learn that, since he was technically a minor, they didn't really hold him. They brought him in, called his dad to come get him, and once he did, he was free to do whatever he wanted to again. Her parents had to press charges and file a restraining order when he slashed the tires on one of their cars, before they finally took action. Shortly after the party, he seemed to only go to school with the sole purpose of harassing Iris and sending us both death threats until he just stopped showing up. I'm unsure if he just dropped, or if he had to change districts due to the charges. This recently came up as I'm still close friends with Iris, and I'm actually the godfather to her two young girls. We started talking about school, and we both went to look him up and found out that he is serving a 12-year sentence for aggravated assault, kidnapping, and a couple other charges, and it really freaked her out. Iris was always a friendly, outgoing girl, and I truly think she had feelings for him, but that soon changed when his true demeanor also came out. I am thankful that she got away from him before something else happened to her. I just feel bad for anyone else that was unfortunate to be involved with him. So, yeah, that was probably one of the most eventful Halloweens that I ever had. Hey, so, I guess it's time for me to share my story, too. I don't know much about aboriginal folktales or anything like that. I can't really even say that I know a lot about the Australian cryptids or things. It is something I would like to get to know more of, and I think there is something like the Yowie and the Bunyip. I don't know. Anyways, this was in the early 2000s, so social media wasn't like how it is now. It was still very much in its early stages. People spent more times on forums rather than MySpace or Facebook. I liked to browse and find interesting and free places to go. One post mentioned a small, abandoned ghost town, where there had been actual sightings of ghosts and other strange things happening. At the time... I thought that maybe people wanted to see ghosts so much that they just ended up seeing them. A small group of friends and I decided to go out into one of the country areas to celebrate Halloween. We were at that age where we couldn't all get into any of the clubs, and we were too old to do any trick-or-treating. None of us had the funds to have a decent house party either, and none of our parents would have agreed to it, so we all decided to give this a try. Fortunately for us, Halloween fell on a weekend, so we didn't need to worry about school. Not that it was a priority for any of us at the time, it wouldn't have been the first time that we skipped school for one reason or another. 
so this is what we decided was best to do. We got some grog, or alcoholic drinks, some snacks, and some other things. You know, more naughty things if you get the drift. We drove out into the middle of nowhere, you know, where the skies are clear from the smog of the city and we wouldn't bother anybody. You know when people say that the veal between the living and the dead is weaker on Halloween? Well, I think that's true. We found an abandoned town. It was so far gone that the roofs were no longer on the buildings and only had the exposed brick. What we didn't realize at first was that we were near an old graveyard. We played some music, got the drinks out, and started having a good time. We were drunkenly singing along with the music, eating, and we just didn't have a single care in the world. It was an amazing night. As the night drew on, we started talking about ghost stories in order to fit the theme of the night. One of my mates started telling us some stupid story that I'm pretty sure was quoted from some awful horror movie, hoping to pass it off as his own. We laughed, and one of my friends, one of the ones who wanted more scary things to happen, wanted for all of us to use an Ouija board. All of us instantly said no to that. The same friend who said his stupid story started going on about a BS Ouija story, one that was about him and his other group of friends. He's always kind of questionable when it comes to integrity. As the night went on, though, both his jokes and stories began to get a lot better to listen to. It got really chilly, though, and I wrapped a picnic blanket around my shoulders. We all complained about the cold, and little things started to happen. We felt like we were being watched. You know that feeling when you can sense eyes on you? We had that. We could have sworn we heard the faint sounds of children whispering and laughing around us. Whenever we turned to look, it would be quiet again. Now, we weren't exactly clear-minded, if you know what I mean. I don't want to incriminate myself with that, but you get my drift. You know that feeling you get when you shouldn't be somewhere, and if you stay, you're going to get into trouble? I was starting to get that. The radio started to get a lot of static, something that hadn't been an issue before, and I was wondering what the hell it could have been. You know how you never notice noise until everything suddenly goes quiet? All the crickets and other insects went dead quiet out of the blue. We then started talking about how it was best for us to sober up and probably leave. I had a mate tell me after that 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 was what happens when there's a predator or something dangerous around. None of us wanted to mess around and find out to see what it was. We started to pack up the car with all the stuff that we brought with us, and we put out the fire, making sure to put it out completely. We didn't want to be the cause of any brush fires. We all sat awkwardly in the car while my mate who was driving was sobering up, drinking coffee and whatever. To be fair, I don't think he was under the limit yet, but we figured we would try our luck anyway. As he was about to drive off, we started hearing that laughing and talking again. That was enough for us. We were out of there. He began to speed up down the deserted road. I decided to look back through the rearview window at the place that we had been, and I swear I saw what looked like a group of shadow figures watching us. Even a flickering light there too. I don't ever want to go back to that place again. So, yeah, be careful what you do on Halloween. I didn't used to believe in spirits or ghosts before, but this experience has turned me into a believer. I don't want to think about what would have happened to us out there if we had stayed. My Halloweens are quiet nowadays, and I hope to keep it that way. So, friends, this was some creepy Halloween stories. Day 7 of our 2022 Halloween Extravaganza Supreme Plus Extra. Sure, let's go with that. 
hopefully you all are enjoying this. This is technically the halfway point, though there are actually eight videos after this, because after this we go back to regular schedule, and that ends on a Monday, so we're going to go back to regular stuff, and it's going to be eight more videos. So anyway, this is the halfway point. We are halfway to the end of the 2022 Halloween extravaganza uh, Supreme Plus Extra. Yeah. I'm going to forget everything. I should write it down, shouldn't I? Anyways, hopefully you all are enjoying this video, or enjoying these videos, and hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please hit that thumbs up button. If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, subscribe. I do this all the time. Do videos all the time. Yeah. And if you would, consider leaving me a comment down below. Letting me know what your plans are for Halloween, if you have any. If not, well, that's okay. If yes, great. But if not, don't feel bad. I don't have any plans either. I believe my plans are to simply exist. Sounds like a good time to me. So, I hope you're all having a great week. Hope your weekend went swimmingly. Hope you're all ready for the rest of the content. And, well, I hope you're just doing well overall. I really do. And of course, my friends, until I do see you again, I hope that you simply sleep well.